very excited to head back into the world of Windows handhelds, but for the first time ever on the channel, we will be checking out an Intel-based handheld. Now with AMD's strong showing last year with its Ryzen 7840U and Z1 Extreme processors going into what seemed like dozens of Windows-based handhelds, it's very apparent that Intel is gearing up for a big year and Blue Team is hoping to gain some traction and take back a piece of the pie. One X player returns to the channel with their upcoming X1, which is more than handheld and will be one of the first with Intel's Meteor Lake-based Core Ultra 7 155H processor and ARC-based integrated graphics. I'm very excited to take a deep dive into the X1 as well as explore Intel's latest Core Ultra processor. Please join me, Rob the Retro Tech Dad, and let's find out together if this Meteor has the impact Intel needs to succeed. So we're going to do things just a little bit differently here than usual. Since it's the first time that the Meteor Lake and the Core Ultra 7 155H are making an appearance, I thought it would be a good idea to talk a little bit about this new chipset. There are actually a lot of firsts here with Meteor Lake, and one of the things you might have noticed is that Intel is no longer using the I designation after their core branding. Meteor Lake marks a significant shift for Intel, which is its first processor with tile-based chiplet architecture for each component. Intel has now joined the likes of both AMD and Qualcomm. It is also the first Intel CPU built on the Intel 4 process, which is Intel's 7 nanometer fabrication process. Meteor Lake processors will only be available in laptops, handhelds, and all-in-one PCs, which means there isn't a socketed version for individual resale. There are 11 planned Core Ultra processors in total, and for this video, we will be focusing on the X1's included Core Ultra 7 155H, which features 16 total cores. It has six Redwood Cove performance cores, eight Crestmont-based efficiency cores, and two low-power Crestmont efficiency cores. On its performance cores, the CPU can boost up to 4.8 gigahertz, and the 155H has a maximum TDP of 28 watts. Now for the likes of what we do on this channel, and for the most interest of my viewers, Meteor Lake and the Core Ultra promises big performance gains in gaming. We now have graphics built in based on Intel's Arc, which promises to really give us some solid games and performance over the prior generation of Intel integrated graphics, almost twice as fast in some cases. We will definitely be exploring the full capabilities of the 155H, but let's first go over the specs of my X1 unit which is equipped with a large and beautiful 10.95 inch 1610 120Hz LTPS display at a resolution of 2560 by 1600 with a maximum brightness of 540 nits. As mentioned earlier, it is powered by the latest from Intel with the Core Ultra 7 155H featuring 16 cores with a max boost of 4.8 GHz. It features integrated graphics based on Intel's Arc with a maximum frequency of 2.25 GHz and features 8 XE cores. My specific unit includes 32GB of LP DDR5X RAM at 7467 MHz. 1X does offer configurations up to 64GB. There is 1TB of MVME SSD internal storage using the M.2 2022 format in my unit with options all the way up to 4TB. The internal storage can be expanded with the micro SD slot. We've got two USB Type-C 4.0 ports, a USB-A 3.2 port, an Oculink port for external graphics, and a 3.5mm audio port. The X1 supports Wi-Fi 6E, 802.11ax, Bluetooth 5.2, and features a massive 65.02 watt hour or 16,890 milliamp hour battery, which 1X claims provides 3 hours of intense gaming, or 10 to 12 hours of video playback. It does ship with Windows 11 out of the box. The X1 is now available for pre-order on Indiegogo, where they have various configurations available, as well as key accessories, including their controller attachment and magnetic keyboard. I will have a link down in the description to their Indiegogo campaign. The X1 starts at 859 US dollars for the Ultra 5 125H model with 16 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte of storage, and goes all the way up to 2,049 US dollars for their maxed out configuration of the Ultra 7 155H with 64 gigabytes of RAM, four terabytes of internal storage, and their 1X GPU, which is their external graphics solution. I'd like to thank 1X for sending me the X1 for the purpose of this video. As I always require, they did not review my video prior to publishing. 
So let's go ahead and tear this seal off and so we can check out the good stuff. I always enjoy a little crunchy ASMR. Unsurprisingly, this is a pretty hefty package. Now this box only contains the tablet since I do have a separate one for the keyboard, which is peeking on screen at the top left. I really like the subtle details on the packaging itself. It definitely feels like a premium product is waiting for us and no doubt a tech one at that. Going around, we have the two-tone with the black and orange accents. The One X brand in general has favored this color scheme. And we do have more One X and X1 branding around the box, clearly letting us know what awaits us. Let's take a look at the back of the box, which gives us an idea of the configuration that was sent over to me by One X. We do have that Intel Core Ultra 7 155H with 32 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte of internal storage. All right, let's flip it back over and get the top cover off so we can dive inside. So it looks like we have the tablet portion wrapped in its protective plastic sleeve. We will put this aside for a moment so we can quickly check out the rest of the contents. A lot of the design elements from outside of the packaging are present here on the inside. It's definitely an attractive looking box. There's a smaller box inserted in here, so I will go ahead and get this out of here and then we can check out what awaits us. Okay, so it looks like we have two different but key items inside of here. The first being the USB Type-C to Type-C cable, which is actually a nicely braided cable and definitely feels nicer than your usual cable. And of course, we have the hefty power supply and understandable as this is a 100 watt GAN fast charger. Beyond that, there is nothing else left here. Now, I did notice after the fact that the lid had a secret envelope underneath it. This envelope contains the user manual, which is fairly standard and goes over the details of the X1 device, as well as the initial setup process. It's actually nicer than a lot of the manuals that I'm used to seeing. So let's grab the X1 tablet and take a look here. It does appear that the back support bracket is already attached, which is magnetic, and taking this off allows us to start peeling off the plastic seal on the tablet. Nothing like the satisfying sounds of pulling off the seals on a brand new piece of tech. So this is really pretty solid in the hands. My first impression is that there's a good bit of weight here. It doesn't feel light, but we will take measurements in just a bit. Let's now go around the X1 tablet and check out what it offers. I'll start at the top left corner of the tablet. First thing that we have here is the turbo button, which actually acts as a way to call up the One X console overlay and definitely very useful to have. Beside that, we have the exhaust vent for the built-in active cooling. Moving along towards the opposite side, we have the Oculink and 3.5mm port, which are protected by this cover that swivels out to reveal the ports. I do like that these are protected to prevent any debris and dust from getting inside. Next to that, we have the volume up and down buttons, and finally the power button. Coming down to the left side, we have the two built-in USB 4.0 Type-C ports that is used for data, charging, and video out. Now you'll notice that my unit has the protective covers on the rail system where you would connect the controller accessory. This gives the tablet a finished appearance when not being used as a handheld. And here's a closer look at this rail system. Below that, we have one of these stereo speakers, which are Harman Sound certified. On the bottom of the tablet, we have a look at the pogo pin system that the magnetic keyboard utilizes to make a connection with the X1 tablet. This is a fairly common system used by many other manufacturers. Moving to the right side, we have the other stereo speaker, the right side rail for the right controller attachment, the micro SD slot for expandable storage, and finally the full size USB-A 3.2 port, which is a nice inclusion here. Now at the front, in the very slim bezel area, we have front facing camera and the inclusion of Windows Hello, which is a very nice feature to have to make logging into your computer nice and easy. It's now time to turn on the X1 for the first time and check out what's in store here. As I mentioned, the X1 does ship with Windows 11 out of the box. This is a pretty standard and clean install of Windows 11 with the usual software from Microsoft pre-installed and only the One X console as additional software installed by One X. The One X console is definitely the key piece of software for this device as it allows us to make many on the fly changes. By pressing the turbo button on the tablet, the One X console overlay appears on screen. From here, we can adjust the TDP. Interestingly, the overlay goes up to 35 watts, but the 155H only supports a max of 28 watts. Below the TDP adjustment, we have the fan settings and you can switch between automatic or two additional presets. We have the ability to adjust the vibration settings here as well. Beyond that, we have the ability to change desktop resolution, which is a very nice and useful feature. 
then making changes to the RGB effects, the performance overlay, which will require the installation of HW Info and RTSS, which will then be a one click to start up performance overlays. Moving along, we have the toggle to enable the turbo for the CPU. We have settings for the brightness, volume, a memory reduction, which frees up RAM from the system. And the gear icon at the bottom right brings up additional settings. Finally, at the bottom left, we have the controller icon, which takes us into the One X launcher, and here you can add your games as a one-stop shop. I can tell that this is not quite finished, as parts of it have not even been translated yet. So let's talk a little bit about the build quality of the X1 tablet. There's no doubt that this feels like a pretty substantial product. The X1 is assembled using one piece of aluminum, which definitely contributes to that premium feel. I do like these subtle details all around on the tablet itself, including the trim, which gives it a unique but clean look. The tablet is no doubt very sturdy, holding up to any flexing or bending. All of the inputs and buttons on my unit work as expected, and I haven't had any real hardware issues to make note of. The display is obviously a big selling point, which comes in at 10.95 inches and uses an LTPS panel with a resolution of 2560 by 1600 that really does have a very nice and sharp image. The larger panel definitely benefits from this higher resolution as you can make out details a lot easier than compared to a smaller handheld. The display is also 120Hz capable, which is very nice for games that can make use of the higher refresh rate. Now, One X claims the panel has a 100% DPI-3 color gamut or a 138% sRGB color gamut. To my eye, the display is definitely a highlight and much appreciated for my aging eyes. I've gotten so used to looking at certain games on smaller panels and I often forget or miss some of the subtle details which come through here on the display. The viewing angles here are top notch with no distortion from side to side or top to bottom and the brightness here scales from a solid minimum level that's acceptable for nighttime viewing and then gets very bright up to 540 nits. The audio on the X1 is equally impressive. The X1 boasts stereo speakers, but these really pack a punch and I couldn't believe how loud they could get. In fact, you will see later on that I had to do my battery testing at 25% instead of the usual 50% because they are still plenty loud at that lower end. However, it does start to scale down, and at 2%, it is almost inaudible. I don't think many will be using its top range at 100%, since in a normal indoor space, that's probably going to be too loud. Now, these are Harman certified speakers, and it was one of the things I immediately noticed with the X1 when using it. They are easily some of the loudest I've used on a device of its kind. Now, these aren't front firing speakers, but where the controller will go, your hands will not obscure their output, and so having them on the side isn't a deal breaker. Let's listen in for a moment and check out how these speakers sound. Now, since I don't have controllers to comment on, I will focus on the next standout feature of the X1, which is its ability to have a magnetic keyboard attached to the unit. Given that we have an almost 11 inch display on hand here, we are now in a realistic territory of being able to use this device for productivity and naturally having some type of keyboard and mouse input would be essential for that. This is very much where the X1 gets part of its three-in-one capabilities. Now, One X tells me that this keyboard is a prototype, but I still wanna take a look at its performance. Personally, I am mixed about the keyboard. Now, understanding some of the limitations of a cover style keyboard, much like we've seen on devices like the Surface, there are obviously some sacrifices that have to be made. Let's talk about what I do like here with the keyboard and surprisingly the travel on the keys themselves I actually found to be quite good. I grabbed my Surface Go type cover, which I think is perfect to make meaningful comparisons to the X1's keyboard. So first, I actually found that I much prefer the typing experience on the X1's keyboard. The keys themselves are also larger and therefore a bit easier to type on. The entirety of the keyboard is backlit as well with two different brightness options as well as the ability to turn it off. Now, an area I didn't like as much was the trackpad being used here. It's definitely on the smaller side, but I just found that its performance in terms of tracking to be a bit frustrating at times. I also didn't care for the way the trackpad clicks in and compared to the Surface one here, it's very obvious that it's just lacking in comparison. The overall fit and finish isn't as nice as the one from the Surface. I noticed that the keyboard doesn't lay entirely flat on my desk and it actually bows up at the sides. This makes typing a bit interesting, since as you type, you can see the movement in the keyboard itself. Whereas that's not an issue on something like the Surface Keyboard. The material is another major thing I found interesting, since I noticed the keyboard on the X1 was sliding all over the place, but on the Surface Keyboard there wasn't any movement at all thanks to its Alcantara finish. 
The magnetic connection is very solid and works very well with the keyboard being immediately recognized in Windows. The connection is strong enough that I can actually lift the X1 by the keyboard and the tablet portion won't fall off. So on a Surface device, the keyboard not only makes a magnetic connection where the pogo pins are, but it can actually attach itself to the front of the bezel area. This is nice since you get that angle on the keyboard. And it's something that for me was very obviously missing on the X1 keyboard and probably part of the reason why I was able to immediately notice that the keyboard doesn't lay entirely flat. Now I don't want to completely sound negative as I think having a magnetic keyboard is still very useful and it's one of my own personal criticisms of something like the Lenovo Legion Go, which to me was a missed opportunity for Lenovo to incorporate a magnetic keyboard design. I never did end up reviewing the Go since it came out at a time when I was getting ready to head out on a family vacation. But interestingly, I took my Legion Go as a laptop replacement for that trip and paired it with a slim folding Bluetooth keyboard and used it like that for two weeks. I didn't find the experience to be as good as what I'm getting here with the X1 in terms of something that can serve as a laptop replacement. Yes, magnets make all the difference here since overall the X1 feels more cohesive as a device that could potentially replace your laptop, but with more flexibility in its arrangement. Again, 1X tells me that this is a prototype and so we will have to wait and see how the final version ends up looking and performing. Now one last feature of the X1 is the magnetic stand. 1X opted to use an additional piece that magnetically attaches to the tablet to give you the ability to prop your X1 on a table. The stand is capable of up to a 135 degree angle and feels pretty sturdy. I do worry that the material covering the hinges will wear down and eventually get torn or expose them. It's an interesting design concept, but ultimately leaves me wondering why 1X didn't just incorporate the stand into the chassis and eliminate the need for this extra piece. Alright, so now it's time to size up the X1 to some other devices. This is going to be a bit shorter than usual since really I had to think about meaningful comparisons to the X1, and so I just rounded up the Lenovo Legion Go, ROG Ally, 1X Player's 1X Fly, and the very compact GPD Win Mini. Now, I was not sent the controller accessory since 1X told me that they were not ready at the time they sent me this unit. So I went ahead and grabbed my Bingbok Joy-Cons for the Switch, which actually resemble the X1 controller accessory, and I will use it as a way to get an idea of what the X1 will look like with controllers. Let's now place the tablet portion of the Legion Go on top of the X1 tablet, and obviously the X1 is larger with its 10.95 inch display. Now I'll add the controller attachments of the Legion Go back on for a different size comparison. Here is the 1X Fly, which is a fairly compact 7040U traditional handheld. Here's the ROG Ally, which definitely stands out thanks to its white body. The Win Mini, which goes for the complete opposite design choice and opts for as compact as possible. Now it's time for some weights. The X1 tablet on its own, without any accessories attached, weighs 804 grams, or about 1 pound 12 ounces. The Legion Go tablet, which weighs 1 pound 6.5 ounces or 640 grams, and with the controllers attached, comes in at 854 grams or 1 pound 14 ounces. Here's the ROG Ally at 1 pound 5.5 ounces or 612 grams, and the Win Mini at 530 grams or about 1 pound 3 ounces. Finally, the entire package of the X1 with the magnetic back cover and magnetic keyboard attached, which comes in at 1,228 grams, which is a little over 2.5 pounds. We're now ready to really take a deep dive into benchmarking the performance of the Core Ultra 7 155H and really get a feel for this new chipset and how it performs across various scenarios. I spent a lot of time in this section, really going through and testing games and just getting comfortable since this is new tech for me and most likely for many watching this video. For all the benchmarking, I made sure to update to the latest available drivers for the Intel graphics. Oddly enough, the Arc software found no updates even when I had the beta toggle on. However, I knew there were newer drivers since I've been following the progress of the Core Ultra processors. The one that was pre-installed on the X1 was from December and a quick visit to the Intel website and I was able to download and install drivers from February 8th, 2024, so definitely much newer. These new drivers were used to conduct all the benchmarking seen in this video. So let's just get right into it with Geekbench 6 first, which is a CPU focused benchmark. I'll start out with the best numbers I could get on my unit running the X1 at 28 watts. With this TDP setting, the X1 scored 10,184 for its multi-core score and 2,305 for its single core score. Now let's change it up a bit and for this I set the X1 to 25 watts to keep it in line with the 25 watt turbo mode on the ASUS ROG Ally so that we can make fair comparisons. 
I also have the Win Mini here with the AMD Ryzen 7 7840U as an additional comparison point. Now the numbers here are very similar. You might notice that the multi-core score is lower on the Z1 Extreme with the ROG Ally, but I do know that ASUS is constantly adjusting things with updates, and I've seen scores for the Z1 Extreme much more in line with the 7040U. It's pretty incredible how close these three are in synthetic benchmarks. Let's now switch over to 3 d Mark, a GPU-focused benchmark with a Time Spy benchmark. With the X1 set to 28 watts again, these were the best numbers I could get for the 155H in Time Spy, which had an overall Time Spy score of 3,691, a graphics score of 3,373, and a CPU score of 7,939. Now, like before, let's compare numbers to the Z1 Extreme and 7040U. The GPU scores for all three devices were very similar, with the advantage going to the 155H. The GPU is a marked improvement over prior generations of Intel integrated graphics. The CPU score was the lowest with the 155H, but it does pull ahead slightly with its overall Time Spy score. Now, it's important to understand that these are strictly synthetic numbers and real world performance can differ quite a bit. So I wanted to go one step further and take a look at numbers using the built-in benchmark modes for a few games. I think this helps give us another way to test the 155H and explore its capabilities further. Let's first start with the oldest game benchmark test using Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I've set all devices to use 15 watts, and in-game we're using the DirectX 12 mode with lowest settings and at a 720p resolution. You can probably see that the ARC-based integrated graphics in the 155H are falling behind here against its AMD competitors. The same can be said for our next test using Forza Horizon 5. I conducted the test using the same 15W TDP across all devices. I first tested using the very low preset at 720p resolution, and the numbers here again really favor the AMD APUs with advantages as much as double in some of the scoring. Yet again, the same story when increasing resolution up to 1080p. I was curious to see if the 155H could pick up the slack at higher resolutions, but the narrative remains the same with the 155H falling behind its competitors. Finally, for one last in-game benchmark, I used Cyberpunk 2077, and this time around, I turned the TDP up to 18 watts for all devices. I really didn't want to go beyond the 15 to 18 watt range for higher end gaming, as I am trying to be considerate that this is a mobile device first, and therefore lower TDPs are always the goal when on battery. In the Cyberpunk benchmark at 720p using low settings, the 155H is unable to close the gap and falls behind the Z1 Extreme and 7040U. Now turning the resolution up to 1080p, and the 155H again falls behind, but slightly closes in on the gap between the Z1 Extreme and 155H. One last benchmark. In this chart, I tracked the average frame rate in the Cyberpunk in-game benchmark starting at 10 watts up through 25 watts. It's mostly what one would expect. As we turn the power up, we get better performance, and this is true for all three comparison points. Interestingly, there's a pretty noticeable and sizable jump from around 14 watts up to 17 watts with the 155H. In my experience, it does seem that we are generally getting the best performance at that 15 to 18 watt range when considering battery life. The gains aren't all that impressive once we start to move past 17 watts, and so it's not worth it when considering said battery life. This also does show that the 155H at every point is unable to gain ground on the others. It will be interesting to see if Intel can improve on things here with updated drivers. It's clear that based on the Geekbench and 3 Mark tests that there is some performance being left on the table, and in-game benchmarking, as well as benchmarking in general, may not be indicative of performance we can expect to see in-game. And speaking of in-game, it's now the perfect time to actually check out some PC games and see how we do fare in-game. For this, I have a pretty wide spread of choices here, and I think results here are actually better than expected. So let's start out with some Diablo 4, which doesn't need much of an introduction here. For Diablo 4, I tested a few things, and first let's talk about Diablo 4 at 12 watts using a 1920x1200 resolution with Intel XE super sampling set to performance, low settings, and a 30 frames per second cap. I was pleasantly surprised that the X1 was doing a very good job managing these settings at the lower 12 watt TDP. I wanted to also test performance at the X1's native resolution, and so with a 2560x1600 using these same settings but with a 15W TDP, and again we're getting very solid performance here. 
Diablo 4 is clearly a game that has some solid scaling options, and given that we are at the 12 to 15 watt range here, we definitely have plenty of headroom to increase settings as desired. For our next game, we have Hogwarts Legacy, which, like Diablo 4, is another game that was released last year. This is seriously an awesome game, and one that Harry Potter fans should definitely check out. For Hogwarts Legacy, I have the X1 set to use 15 watts and with a 1920 by 1200 resolution with Intel XESS set to performance and low settings, we are staying locked to that 30 frames per second cap that I've set here. I think this is very solid performance and quite impressive at 15 watts to see this running as well as it is with the X1. Spider-Man Miles Morales is always a PC game that I love to check out, and it will be one of two Sony ports that we will be checking out in this video. Miles Morales is easily one of my favorites, and I actually love starting this one up because it's got such an awesome intro segment. For Miles Morales, we are set to a resolution of 1280 by 800 using AMD's FSR, which is set to performance and very low settings. I have the X1 set to 15 watts, and things are running quite well here, staying at or close to that 30 frames per second target. And here is God of War, which is the other Sony port to PC that I will be showing off here. God of War marks quite the change for the series, introducing a lot of new elements. It's a fantastic game that comes highly recommended for me. For God of War, I wanted to test the native resolution of 2560 by 1600 and using AMD's FSR set to ultra performance with the X1 set to 18 watts, we are staying close or locked to that 30 frames per second target. Again, I'm trying not to go beyond that 18 watt setting when demonstrating gameplay, but this does give us a good idea of where we can go, and definitely expect better performance when maxing out at 28 watts. Forspoken is another game being featured for this PC game showcase that was released last year and suffered from performance issues on PC at the time of its launch. It's had a number of patches that have helped improve some of the performance, but it has always been a pretty difficult game to run. For this game, I have the X1 set to use 18 watts and a resolution of 1920 by 1200 with a 30 frames per second cap using low settings and I'm actually pleasantly surprised by how well things are going here. It's mostly staying close to that 30 frames per second target. Finally, for the last PC game I wanted to demonstrate, Alan Wake 2 is the long awaited sequel to the original Alan Wake and is a new release coming out back in October of last year. Now, I wanted to showcase this game because it does have some pretty bad issues with the ARC-based integrated graphics. There are all sorts of graphical issues which you can actually see here around the police car and on the character's eyes. When you try to disable global reflections, the colors also appear to be inverted. I've actually looked up these issues and they are known issues with ARC graphics that Intel states they are addressing, but it looks like this was documented back in January. Another concerning thing here that I've noticed is when adjusting TDP, it seems to have no impact on performance. In other words, I could be set to 18 watts or 28 watts and the game cannot go beyond that 20s range we are seeing in the frame rate. This is definitely a good example of a AAA game that is having issues with the current state of Intel drivers and something that is worth keeping an eye on. There's no doubt that the 155H has the power to run this a lot better and I do hope we see further improvements from Intel. So I've really been enjoying testing how games can potentially run on the opposite end of the spectrum. And something that I think is very important for any device that runs off batteries is to really look at what we can get away with at the lower TDPs. This is something that I've been incorporating in my x86 reviews as while I definitely enjoy pushing the limits of what's possible, I also like pushing the limits of what's possible using as little power as possible. I'll start this out with a fantastic game that's been running in the background. Sea of Stars is usually one of my go-to tests for very low TDP gaming. I have the X1 set to use the minimum available in the One X console, which is 6 watts, and at this setting, Sea of Stars is running at 1920 by 1200 with an unlocked frame rate, and it's doing very well here with just 6 watts. We are really sipping on battery here. Another game that I really enjoy using as a test for lower TDP is Supergiant Games Fantastic Hades. This is easily one of my personal favorites, and I have the X1 set to use 7 watts with a 1280 by 800 resolution and unlocked frame rate. I do think the X1 is doing an excellent job handling everything that Hades is throwing at it. It's always impressive to see a game like Hades running at a very low TDP, and 7 watts is particularly impressive. Persona 3 Reload is a very new release, just coming out a few weeks ago. Naturally, because of how new it is, this is the first time that I get to feature Reload on the channel. Persona 3 Reload is a full remake of Persona 3, and this is a very high quality remake that still stays true to the original game, but brings for me at least some welcome changes, including a visual presentation that is much in line with Persona 5. This game is available as part of the Xbox Game Pass as well, and it comes highly recommended. 
Now, I was pretty optimistic that Persona 3 Reload would be a good candidate for my low TDP showcase, and here I have the X1 set to use 8 watts with a native resolution of 2560 by 1600 using a 50% render scale at 1280 by 800 and low settings and performance overall is very solid and again an absolute delight to see at such low TDPs. Finally, for our last game and one that I have used a few times in the past as a good benchmark of lower TDP performance. Octopath Traveler is always a great game to showcase and talk about given its awesome visual style and great turn-based RPG gameplay that much like the original features multiple characters to play as. I've had great success with Octopath at lower TDPs, and the X1 is set to use only 8 watts here with a resolution of 1920 by 1200 using low settings. This is another game that I think the X1 is handling quite well, maintaining its frame rate. So as much as I love talking about PC games and easily could spend an entire video on it, I think it's time to talk about emulation, and I think this is going to be a point of interest for many as the Core Ultra 7 155H is a very new product and therefore unfamiliar in terms of some of its performance capabilities when it comes to emulation. This was a portion I spent a good amount of time on, really testing and trying to get a feel for performance and where we stand. Things are definitely very interesting here, and I will say overall that I did come away quite impressed by the performance that we are seeing here. I think Team Blue is very much on the right path here, and I'm hoping that we will see further refinements, especially with drivers. So let's first start out on the Nintendo side, and I will go in generational order with the GameCube up first. I don't think it's much of a surprise that something like F-Zero GX is capable of running on the X1, given that the Core Ultra 7 is one of Intel's top Meteor Lake SKUs. I have the NTSC version of F-Zero GX here running at two times the native resolution, using the Vulkan backend in the latest build of Dolphin, and the X1 is set to only 10 watts. This is very solid performance and quite impressive given the power draw here. Moving to the other console that Dolphin can handle, I have Super Mario Galaxy 2 here using the same Vulcan backend and running at two times the native resolution with the X1 set to 10 watts as well. This is another game that is performing very well here with Dolphin on the X1. I'm definitely paying attention to the power draw here as I really like seeing these higher end chips handle GameCube and Wii on the lower end of the power scale. Now keep in mind that dropping the upscaling will result in a slightly lower power draw, which I will demonstrate with PS2 emulation in just a bit. Let's now move to the Wii's successor with the Wii U and using this Simu emulator. I was very impressed here with performance. Simu is an emulator that does quite a bit of shader compilation, so subsequent playthroughs are always smoother. I tested some of my usual favorites here, and of course, Yoshi's Woolly World makes a return to the channel, which is a game I like to test on the lower side of TDP. I have the X1 set to use only 7 watts here, and at the Wii U's native resolution, we are having no issue at all staying locked to the game's 60 frames per second target. Now instead of featuring Wind Waker for GameCube, I always like to show off a bit of the HD remaster for Wii U whenever we have an x86 device on the channel. I like the presentation of both versions and I do think the Wii U version is well worth checking out as the gorgeous visuals are a definite treat here. Wind Waker HD is another game that is just sipping from that core ultra with the X1 set to use only 8 watts. The game is using the Wii U's native resolution and has no issue staying at that 30 frames per second target. The nice thing here is that given we are at only 8 watts, we have a lot of room to increase power usage as needed for potentially more demanding areas or even to start to go beyond the Wii U's native resolution. Now for the last Nintendo console, we of course have to talk about the Switch. The performance of Switch emulation has come a long way, especially on x86 where it has had far more time to mature. For the sake of simplicity, I am running all the games here using Switch's handheld mode. I started out with a game that I know is easier to run, and Advance Wars Reboot Camp is an awesome remake of the first two Advance War games from the Game Boy Advance with development handled by WayForward. For Advance Wars, I have the X1 set to use 12 watts, and performance overall is pretty solid at this TDP. I felt like 12 watts was a good balance between performance and battery life considerations. The game switches from 30 frames per second when you are in the overhead mode and then changes to 60 frames per second for the battle cutscenes. Ironically, the battle cutscenes are not at a full 60 frames per second on the Switch, and yes, here on the X1, it is the same case as the Switch. You can turn the TDP up, but I find it's really not worth it, and the game does run great as is with 12 watts. Super Mario Wonder has been a game I've really been enjoying showcasing with Switch emulation and Yuzu. This is a fantastic traditional 2D platforming style Mario game with great new gameplay mechanics and awesome graphics. It is also a game that happens to emulate quite well with Yuzu, and the X1 is yet again set to use only 12 watts, and the game is performing very well here as well. 
Finally, let's check out one more Mario game, and I feel like we can't showcase Switch emulation without at least showing off some Super Mario Odyssey. Easily one of the best games for the Nintendo Switch, and here we have the X1 set to use only 13 watts. And once most of the shader compilation has taken place, the game is quite smooth running at only 13 watts in the handheld mode. I think between the amazing progress of Yuzu and the power we have here with the 155H, Switch emulation is proving to be really solid on this device. So let's now switch over to the Xbox side of things, and first we will start out with some original Xbox emulation with the XMU emulator. One of my absolute favorite exclusive games for the original Xbox is Jet Set Radio Future, which to this day is still an Xbox exclusive. Thankfully, Jet Set Radio Future emulates pretty well with XMU, and I have the X1 set to use 10 watts, and the game is actually using two times the native resolution, which just looks super sharp on this screen. The game is still a blast to play through, and has an absolutely killer soundtrack. Now I wanted to showcase a different game on the original Xbox side, and Amped 2 is another exclusive Xbox game that is very much well worth playing through with great visuals, gameplay, and an equally awesome soundtrack. I turned the power up a little bit more for this one, and the X1 is set to use 12 watts here, but it, we are still running games with that 2 times native upscaling. The graphics really look so good when upscaled, and it's just awesome to see here. Now here is where things get really interesting. Xbox 360 emulation with Xenia Canary did not fare as well as any of the other consoles that I've tested here for this video on the X1. I'm not sure if this is a driver issue, but there is clearly something that Xenia does not like about the Core Ultra. I observed that no matter what TDP setting I was using, the GPU was always at 99%. Therefore, every game that I've tested exhibited awful performance, which really surprised me as I do think the Core Ultra will have no issues handling a lot of the 360 library. I tested a lot of my usual games including Forza Horizon, Elo Milo, and even some other games like Burnout Revenge, but performance was just terrible across the board. Again, despite making adjustments, that GPU was always stuck in 99% utilization, and is very much similar to what I demonstrated with Alan Wake 2 earlier. I will need to keep an eye on this and possibly investigate further as to what could be the issue here, but there's a good chance that this is driver related. So we're now done with the Microsoft consoles, let's hop on over to the Sony side and start with the lightest of all emulators here with PlayStation Portable Emulation and PPSSPP. Performance here is completely the opposite of what I've experienced with Xenia Canary, and I definitely expected it to be good given what I've already seen with the Core Ultra. I started out with my usual go-to light test, and Local Roco makes a return again to the channel, set to a 10 times native resolution upscaling, with the X1 set to only 7 watts, and things are running really well, and if you haven't seen Local Roco upscaled, it's a real treat as the art style lends itself very well to the upscaling and benefits from it. Okay, to be fair, Local Roco can run on almost anything, and while 10 times upscaling is very impressive, let's now check out some God of War Chains of Olympus, and here we are set to use 6 times the native resolution, with the X1 set to use 8 watts, and it's another game that is doing very well here. I think it's very safe to say that PSP emulation with PPSSPP is going to be no issue with the X1 and the Core Ultra. So let's head on over to Sony's home console, and we will skip right ahead to the PlayStation 2 using the PCSX2 emulator. For PlayStation 2 emulation, I actually did two different tests. One to see how much power we would need to get the game to run at native resolution, and then a second one to see how much we would need to handle five times the native resolution, which puts us around the resolution of the X1's display. So I got my feet wet with a lighter game to first test out using one of my personal favorites, Ape Escape 2. First with PCSX2 at native resolution, Ape Escape 2 managed to run quite well at just 7 watts. Now let's bump it up quite a bit, and with 5 times the native resolution, Ape Escape 2 is holding on at about 9 watts, and for me, this is just incredible performance. Ape Escape 2 is looking super crispy at this 5 times native upscaling. Alright, let's switch gears, no pun intended, and check out some Gran Turismo 4. For this, I tested two different tracks, and for regular viewers of the channel, yes, we're going back to my hometown of New York City. First, with Gran Turismo set at native resolution, the X1 needed about 9 watts to be able to handle this far more demanding game compared to Ape Escape 2. Now let's increase the internal resolution and go with that 5 times upscaling in the New York track. I have the X1 set to use about 13 watts, which does seem to be holding on and handling this massive boost in resolution. I can't believe this is a PlayStation 2 game at times, it's absolutely gorgeous. Okay, let's now make the trip to my current home state of Arizona and check out the immense beauty of the Grand Canyon. Once again, Gran Turismo is set at native resolution here using about 9 watts, and definitely no issues here. 
Let's now turn it up to use five times the native resolution. And again, in about 13 watts, the X1 is handling this beautiful track without much issue. This is a real treat to see in person and the visuals are just stunning. Finally, for another PlayStation 2 game I wanted to test out, and another one that is pretty demanding. Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus is always a joy to boot up and start playing with its gorgeous visuals and excellent gameplay. This has always been a favorite of mine from back in the day, and I love the entire series. Like Gran Turismo, I have Sly Cooper first set to use the PlayStation 2's native resolution, and again, similar to Gran Turismo, the X1 is using about 9 watts here, and Sly Cooper is running very well. So let's go ahead and increase the internal resolution to use five times, and this is definitely one game you will want to really enjoy the upscaling as the visuals clean up nicely, letting that cell shaded style shine. Again, like Gran Turismo, it seems that five times upscaling needs about 13 watts from the X1 to be able to run as you see here. It's time to jump now one generation ahead and check out PlayStation 3 emulation with the RPCS3 emulator. PlayStation 3 emulation is always fun to check out and track the progress of. I did a pretty massive video on the RPCS3 emulator with the ROG Ally, and much of the video still serves as an excellent guide to set up and also what's possible with RPCS3. I always like to start this out with a game that typically does well on a range of systems, especially at lower TDPs. Dragon's Crown is definitely not a stranger to the channel, and it's still a PlayStation exclusive, so outside of emulating the PS3 and Vita versions, we still don't have any other way to enjoy the game on PC. Dragon's Crown is very solid with RPCS3, and here on the X1 we are running the game at 10 watts using the native PS3 resolution. Unfortunately, I am still experiencing occasional issues with the audio, even at this setting. Now, another game that I absolutely love playing, especially with RPCS3, is Wipeout Fury HD. This one surprised me a bit, as it seemed to need more power than I was expecting. So, for Wipeout Fury, I had to turn the TDP up to 18 watts to get the type of performance that you are seeing here. The game definitely smoothed out after majority of shader compilation finished, and even then still manages to get drops in frame rate even at 18 watts. Moving on to another awesome game, Skate 3 is a fantastic skateboarding game that to this day is still stuck on Xbox 360 and PS3, so outside of original hardware we really have no other way to enjoy this great game without the use of RPCS3 or Xenia. Skate 3 is another game that seemed to really like the 18 watt TDP setting, and again, once majority of shader compilation completed, the performance smoothed out and gameplay was pretty solid at the 18 watt TDP. And of course, we have to showcase one of the hardest games to run with RPCS3 even to this day. God of War 3 definitely requires a few tweaks to get it running the way that you are seeing here. As I usually do with this game, you're going to want to enable game patches and disable a lot of the special effects that gives a nice speed boost with a game like God of War 3. I was hoping that 18 watts would be the sweet spot for RPCS3 with the X1, but it does seem that God of War cannot maintain the 30 frames per second target that I've set for it, and it's still dropping below the mark. So, as always, after all of this gaming, how does the X1 perform when it comes to battery life and thermals? We know that the X1 has a pretty hefty 65 watt hour battery, and almost expected given the larger footprint it has to work with. So, let's start out with the worst case scenario, running the X1 at 28 watts, which really I don't think is necessary at all to enjoy a lot of what the X1 can offer in terms of gaming. The X1 is set to use 50% brightness and 25% volume since it's quite audible even at 25% with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on, and we were able to hit almost 1 hour and 30 minutes of on-screen gameplay in Returnal with the settings turned up a bit more than usual to really push those 28 watts. Now for a more realistic target, I have Returnal again, but this time set to 15 watts using the same 50% brightness, 25% volume with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on, and settings adjusted accordingly, and we were able to get a little over 2 hours and 30 minutes of on-screen gameplay. Definitely an improvement, and better than many other x86 devices because of the larger battery capacity in here. Finally, for the lightest test, as usual, I have Yoshi's Island for Super Nintendo using SNES 9X, and we have the X1 set to use the minimum 6 watts with 50% brightness, 25% volume, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on, and the X1 did manage a little over 5 hours and 40 minutes. So let's take a look at thermals. Now I don't have the controller attachment and therefore can't test whether the heat from the shell of the X1 will travel to the controller area, 
but given it's a separate attachment, I suspect it will not. And so while using the controller attachment, you can make the assumption that you will not be in direct contact with the hottest parts of the tablet. I tested thermals with the X1 after one hour of on-screen gameplay using Returnal at 18 watts, which again is my upper limit of what I like to use for gaming when on a battery using an x86 device. At 18 watts, the X1 is doing a pretty solid job moving heat away from the shell of the X1. At the entirety of the display area, I didn't observe surface temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius, and for the most part, it stayed in that mid-30s range. At the top of the unit, around the edges and where the exhaust vent is, it's pretty much the same story with that mid-30s range, and of course, at the exhaust vent itself, the highest temperatures that I have recorded, which is 40 degrees Celsius, and expected as the air is moving out from here. Now on the back, I recorded temperatures with both the magnetic cover on and off to give an idea of how much heat is being transferred to the magnetic stand, and if it does help a bit when holding the X1 as a tablet. Again, much like the rest of the tablet, temperatures are around that mid-30s range, with the coolest portion naturally being at the intake vent hitting 30 degrees even. With the magnetic cover removed, let's now check the thermals on the tablet directly. It does seem that it's just barely hotter without the cover removed, amounting to no more than 1-2 to two degrees Celsius, and so really the back cover is just staying in that same temperature range. And I will say that holding the tablet with the back cover on didn't feel hot at all, and even when removing the back cover, it wasn't too hot to handle. I think it's pretty impressive overall that with the X1 set to 18 watts, surface temperatures were very consistent and in an acceptable range. And as we start to get to the end of this in-depth look, let's talk a little bit about what One X is trying to achieve here with their 3-in-1 concept. I think that with a larger Windows handheld, we start to consider what its use case can be. Now, I recently covered GPD's Win Mini, which very much goes in the opposite direction of what One X is trying to accomplish here. The Win Mini is very portable, but in reality, given its keyboard and screen size, is not really a device that I'd sit down and write out a Word document. In the middle, we have lots of Windows handhelds that really do quite well with what we would expect traditionally from a handheld gaming device. And then there's the X1. With its massive 10.95 inch screen, it becomes a device that leans more into a realistic option for those looking for something like a laptop or laptop replacement. Given the power on hand here with the X1, not only can you sit down and use this as a laptop, but when you're in the mood, the X1 transforms into a handheld, albeit a large one. However, with its unique form factor, you can always prop it up using its kickstand and bring out a traditional controller, and for someone that might travel a lot, you suddenly have a decent big screen experience and a device with mobility. I applaud what One X is trying to do here with the X1, and as the saying goes, go big or go home, and I do think that the X1 embraces that and runs with it. It's not all perfect, obviously, and because I have a prototype keyboard and I'm missing the controller accessory, this is just a very in-depth look at what the X1 could potentially bring to the table. I hope that in the near future I can follow up and share my experiences with the controller and possibly the final version of the keyboard accessory because they are in many ways what will make the X1 shine against its competition. So is the X1 a concept that appeals to you? Let me know down in the comments what you think. I'll be sending this X1 along to H over at Retro Handhelds and I definitely recommend checking out his coverage of the X1 for another perspective. I know it won't be long before we return to the world of Windows, but until then, as always, I am the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.